All right. Welcome. Hello. My name is Austin. Um, I'm a part of the team here at Waypoint, and I'm glad you're here today. We're glad you're here today. Uh, I hope you guys, you and your family, had a wonderful time celebrating the 4th, right? It was good. Hopefully you all have your, uh, have all your fingers. So it's, you know, it's, it happens. Hopefully not to you, but it happens, all right? So hopefully you had a great time celebrating the 4th. I also hope that this week uh, you, you maybe made some time to stop and Sabbath. Or maybe that's on the docket for you today. Either way, Sabbath is on the docket again for our conversation today. Sabbath, uh, as we learned last week, comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. So let's all say that together again. Ready? Shabbat. Yep, pretty easy. Shabbat. Um, which literally means to stop, to cease, or finish. Um, but it could also mean to rest, delight, or celebrate, um, or worship. And so that's kind of how we're going to walk through this series that's taking up all of the month of July as we navigate this word, Sabbath, and the ideas behind Sabbath, stop, rest, delight, and worship. So that's, that's the plan. Uh, last week, we covered stop. Um, we learned that the two Sabbath is to first and foremost to stop. Stop what? You might ask. Like, what does that mean? I don't know what that means for you, <laughs> quite honestly. And that's kind of a little bit what we talked about that last week. You only know what that means for you. For me, stopping meant taking a nap, making time to take a nap which I think is quite literally like the most stop thing that you can do other than like die, right? Like you, you take a nap, you're, you're just, you're out. You're, the, your phone's not, like you're, you're, especially when I take a nap now, you know, like when you got littles, a toddler and a six week old, like when you, you, when you take a nap and you're out, okay? Well, kind of, maybe. You parents know what I'm talking about. Okay, you can go to sleep, but you also, when you hear the cry, you, you know when to wake up. See, some of us do. Some of us do. So, I took a nap, and if you engage with us on social media, uh, we invited you to make time to stop. And because that's really, that's all any of this is. It's, a, it's an invitation. It's an invite. And it's an invitation that echoes the invitation of Jesus at the end of Matthew chapter 11. That invitation where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the invitation, should we accept it. So, and to most of us, if not all of us, rest for our souls, it sounds nice, right? Like that, that sounds nice. But honestly, again, I would probably just settle for a nap. Probably just settle for, for some rest, period. Like, Jesus, I'm, I'm tired, dude. Like, I could definitely use rest for my soul. Yes, I would definitely want that. But can we just start with the basics, okay? Can we just get your boy a nap and a vacation or something like that, okay? And so it, it's, it's, don't get me wrong, in, in a, a nap and vacation, it's, it's a great thing. But I mean, see, when I mean vacation, I mean vacation. It means without your kids. Yeah, I heard a laugh because you know what I'm talking about, okay? It's not, I love my kids. I love my kids, but it's, it, that's a trip. That's definitely a trip. Like, we're making memories and we're having a good time, absolutely, but it's also absolutely not a vacation. Um, so there you go. Maybe we agree. Um, so Jesus, can we just start there, right? Nap and a vacation, for me. Except if we really understood what Jesus is inviting us to into here, um, we wouldn't be settling for just a nap and vacations. And like I said, a nap and vacation, like that's, those are great. And maybe, maybe it's not naps and vacations for you. Maybe it's, maybe it's that raise that you've been hoping for, expecting. As inflation has gone up, 
as things have become more and more expensive, the cost of living has gone up, maybe that's, maybe that's, like, that's what I need, or that promotion, or that new house, or new car, or to, or to travel here, or to travel there, to experience this, whatever you think, like, if only I had that, did this, had more of that, maybe then, maybe I could rest. Except it wouldn't be enough. It would never be enough. We would still be restless. I asked this question last week, are you tired? Because most of us are. Studies show that three out of five Americans admit that they are more tired than they have ever been. That's why it's no surprise when you ask someone how they're doing and they respond, oh, I'm, I'm good, just tired, right, you know. I'm good, just tired. And it's even less of a, a surprise when the response is busy. I'm good, but I'm busy, man. Things are crazy. Aside from being tired, we as a society are more busy than ever. And it's like one of those things where you're not cool unless you're busy. It almost feels like that, right? Like you're not cool unless you're just, you're, you're always up to something, doing something, a part of something, volunteering, doing, which by the way, if you volunteer here, thank you. We're really appreciative of that. But like, we're just busy. Okay, and it's definitely not cool to be bored. You never hear anyone say, hey, how you doing? Just bored. I don't know, just bored. Like, nobody says that, okay? Actually, that, that's false. I know one person that says that, and they're probably here today. But that's because, that's because this person, she's actually so used to being super busy, like so crazy up here busy, that when she's not up here busy, she thinks she's bored. Um, so anyway, that, Lynn Christopoulos, if you're here, <laughs> <laughs> Cut it out. Anyway, um, you, you just wouldn't hear anyone say, yeah, I, like it would almost be embarrassing. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm bored. Here, here's where I'm going with this. We're not just tired. We're restless. We're tired because we're busy. We're busy because we're restless. And we're restless because our desire or desires are infinite. Thomas Aquinas, this is a medieval uh, philosopher, um, theologian, once asked the question, what would it take to satisfy human desire? And the answer he came to was everything. Everything. You would have to experience everything and everyone and be experienced by everything and everyone to feel satisfied, fully satisfied. Human desire is infinite, and human desire is infinite because... We were made to live with God forever in his world, and nothing less than that will ever satisfy us. And I know that's like the cliche, and I really like the way that Dallas Willard puts this. He writes, desire is infinite because, partly because we were made by God, made for God, made to need God, made to run on God. We can be satisfied only by the one who is infinite eternal, and able to supply all our needs. We are only at home in God when we fall away from God. The desire for the infinite remains, but it is displaced upon things that will certainly lead to destruction. Nothing in this life apart from God can ever satisfy your desire because your desire is infinite. And only God is the solution to that problem. And so what happens is we end up in this chronic state of restlessness at best or worse, frustration. I imagine we've been there before. Anger, angst, disappointment from disillusionment when something isn't what we thought it was all cracked up to be, which all ironically only leads to a life of more hurry, a life of hustle, overload, materialism, careerism, a life of more and more accumulation and accomplishment, more busyness, which only in turn makes us more restless. Then, just to throw gas on the fire since we're having such a great time this morning, um, add in, add in the digital marketing and advertising strategies of our day. The average person sees over at least, sorry, at least 4,000 advertisements in a day. 
If you were to Google that, like, what is the average person, what's the average advertisement? It'd be 4,000 to 10,000. So at least 4,000 advertisements in a day. And all of them, all of them are designed to stoke the fire of desire in your belly. Buy this. Do this. Eat this. Drink this. Own this. Go here. Go there. And on top of that, the desire that the, then social media creates as we subconsciously compare our own lives to the highly curated digital platform of influencers or even our own friends and family. Right? When our innate human restlessness, our infinite desire collides with the digital age and culture of accumulation and accomplishment that we live in, the result is an epidemic of emotional unhealth and spiritual death. Author and pastor A.J. Swoboda writes this about the times we face. Similarly, challenging times, or challenging, are the cultural realities we face in. Our 24-7 cultural conveniently, culture, sorry, conveniently provides every good and service we want, when we want it, and how we want it. Our time-saving devices Technological conveniences and cheap mobility have seemingly made life much easier and interconnected. As a result, we have more information at our fingertips than anyone in history, yet with all of this progress, we are ominously dissatisfied. In bowing at these sacred altars of hyperactivity, progress, technological compulsivity, our souls increasingly pant for meaning and for value and truth as they wither away exhausted, frazzled, displeased, ever on edge. The result is a hollow culture that, in Paul's words, is ever learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Increasingly so, our bodies wear ragged, our spirits thirst. We have an inability to simply be still or sit still and be as we drown ourselves in a 24-7 living. We seem to be able to do anything but quench our true thirst for the life of God. We have become perhaps the most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, spiritually malnourished people in history. Whew. How y'all feeling today? Sun sunshine and rainbows? <laughs> this is heavy stuff, all right? Now, friends, I have gospel for you. I've got good news. The good news is this. In our human condition of restlessness in 2023, Jesus Christ comes to offer you rest. And not just rest for your bodies, but that's important too. But rest that encompasses all of you. The rest that Jesus invites us into is a rest for our entire being. The rest is not just an idea that we like mentally assent to. Like if I just understand this about Jesus' words and language and, and what he means when he says rest for your souls. But it's actually, an, if I just get that, then I'll, then I'll feel at rest. No, it's actually a very real, very tangible rhythm that God created into the very fabric of the universe. Sabbath. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Genesis 2 one more time, and I know we read this last week, but we're going to read it again. This is verse 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, and on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, when I hear the word rest, I typically think of like a nap or sleep. Could just be the stage of life I'm in. Or maybe it's a little bit of extra time in my day, a day off, a few hours, some quiet time, just some time to like relax, decompress, right? But the idea of Sabbath is far more than that. It's, it's a holy rest, a day that God called holy, set apart, or what Jesus refers to as rest for your souls, for your whole person. So this rest on the Sabbath, we rest and we rest from work. It's relatively simple. All work. Not just paid work, not just our jobs, but all work. We're encouraged to rest from all work. It's an invitation to rest 
from all work. This includes, like, chores, errands, to-do lists. We rest from working, but it's also more than that. Rabbi um, Heschel, uh, in his book called The Sabbath, he says, uh, we rest not from just work, but from even thinking about work. Some of us can't even fathom the idea of not even thinking about work. Neuroscientists tell us that when we think about work, even if we are at home resting, it releases the same stress chemicals in our brain as if we were in the office in the actual situation. So we rest from even the thought of working, but even more still, we rest from wanting and worrying. We rest from the thoughts that feed our desires and perpetuate our restlessness. You may or may not know this, but the Ten Commandments are recorded twice in the Old Testament. The first we read last week in Exodus 20, when Israel was at the foot of Mount Sinai, right after leaving Egypt. The second is in Deuteronomy 5, right on the edge of the Jordan, as they're about to enter into the Promised Land. There are 40 years between these two readings of the, of the Ten Commandments, which means Deuteronomy 5 is to the next generation. This next generation who were kids at Mount Sinai or not even born yet. And so the Sabbath command, it is similar, but it's also a little bit different. This is Deuteronomy 5, verse 12 through 15. Observe the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. There are two key differences between the Sabbath commandment in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. The first is small. In Exodus, it's to remember the Sabbath. We talked about this last week. Here in Deuteronomy, it's to observe the Sabbath. That word is the Hebrew word shamar, and it means to watch over, to keep, or to guard. And I like that word guard specifically because I think, I think it really paints a picture of what we are supposed to do with this day. Think of how we observe a holiday, right? Or a holy day, holiday, holy day, right? Okay, such as Christmas or Easter or, I mean, for goodness sakes, in our culture, the 4th of July, right? Okay, we guard it. Don't mess with my 4th. My boat is on the lake. It's ready to go. Okay, the fireworks all planned, Things that, people are coming over, it's going to be a great time. We, we guard it, we make it special, we make it unique. That is the idea for Sabbath, it's to be a weekly holiday, a weekly day that we are to keep over, guard, lest it just become an ordinary day. This is why in the Kiddush, which is the ancient Jewish liturgy, the beginning of the Sabbath, you light two candles to symbolize the two commandments. Remember the Sabbath and observe the Sabbath. The rest commandment is verbatim until the end. And then there is a major change there at the end of Deuteronomy 5. And that's what we're getting at. In Exodus, for six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. But in Deuteronomy, it is, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. I think I've underlined this in the next one, so that way we can, there we go, thank you. This is the difference. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God has brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It's the same command, okay, but there is a whole other rationale behind the command. In Exodus, the rationale is grounded in the story of creation, the rhythm that God established in the world at the beginning when he created everything to rest on the seventh day. And then in Deuteronomy, it's grounded in the story of liberation. You were slaves in Egypt, but you're not slaves anymore. In Exodus, Sabbath is about a rhythm, right? Stopping. 
and remembering. In Deuteronomy, it's also about resistance. When the command was given in Exodus, the people who were listening would have been fresh out of slavery. In Deuteronomy, this is a whole nother generation who perhaps needed to be reminded that we not only, not only do we rest because God rested and created us to do so as well, but also because they might have forgotten or never knew what it was like to be slaves in the first place. That in Egypt, there was no rest. And now, rest is what comes as you are set free from God. So the command is to remember that you're not slaves anymore. You are in a new kingdom under a new king. There is no daily quota, no slave driver over your head. You're free to work and you're free to rest too. And you should do both. In 2023, we might not be slaves to Pharaoh. But I do believe that many of us are slaves to our culture. And while the Egyptian empire is long gone, I believe that the spirit of Egypt remains. A spirit that feeds on our restlessness and desire for more. As a culture, we work more than ever before. Conservatives estimate that now we spend ten, two to ten times more on goods and services than our ancestors did in 1945. Our homes are three times larger and full of twice as many things. The average home in America has over 300,000 items in it. And that's not just the rich, that's the average. Here in the U.S., there are 2.3 billion square feet of self-storage space. That's something like 7.3 square feet for every person in our nation. Meanwhile, many people all around us hiding in plain sight and possibly sitting right next to you or in the same room as you right now are barely able to put food on the table. And it's so easy just to get sucked into the culture, to feel like you have to work those extra hours just to get ahead, like you have to reach a certain standard of living just to be happy. You have to own this. You have to just do that. You have to have this. But it doesn't have to be that way. That is why Sabbath rest is an act of resistance. It's an act of defiance against Pharaoh and his empire. It was then and it is still is now, today. It's a way of saying with your body, enough. Enough. Enough work. Work is a good thing. It's a great thing. We should work. We were made to work, just like God worked. But it is not the thing. Enough stuff. Stuff isn't bad. But most of us have more than enough. Sabbath is a way to break our addiction to accomplishment and accumulation. It's an invitation to just be still and just be. And to practice gratitude for what we have and enjoy the goodness of God in our lives now. This can be really hard to do. I think of my own context, especially with with toddlers. They just want everything. There's a, there's a, a book we read, um, and I'm, I'm now losing it's the blank of it. Um, anyway, on the back of the book, and so, I think some of the books have this, but on the back of the book is all the books that you don't have, right? So you've got this one. This is a great book. Okay, it's Adam Raccoon. It's an Adam Raccoon book. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, they've got fun little stories about you know, this lion that's a God character. And anyway, not to riff off of C.S. Lewis. Here we go. On the back of the book, it's got all the books that you don't have, and almost every time we're done reading, you know, we get to that point, she's almost excited to flip to that point, and she goes, for Christmas, Dada? I'm like, sure. I like reading these books. But it's like, it's like, can't we just enjoy the end of this book? She's so quick to just flip to the end of the page. And like, for Christmas? Ask Mama for Christmas. So I get it. And then I know they turn into teenagers, no offense to you teenagers in the room, okay? I want all the stuff too. I really do, okay? So I get it. It is hard. It is hard to, I, to, to even just think about what it might look like to rest, to put aside accomplishment and accumulation, to say no to these idols in our culture. 
And my point is, my point is that these two things aren't necessarily evil. Accomplishment and accumulation, they can even be good, but there is a limit, and at some point you need to draw a line and say, this is as far as I'll go, and no further. I do not need to work more hours. I do not need to make more money. I do not need a new car. I do not have to have the perfect grade or the perfect body or the perfectly clean house with the perfectly manicured landscape. I do not need to earn my human father's or mother's or friend's approval here. I already have it in my heavenly father. We remember We remember on this day, and we remember that Pharaoh and his army are at the bottom of the Red Sea, that I am free, that I have all I need to thrive with God in his world, and that I am a part, I'm invited and a part of a new kingdom now with a new king. However, the culture that I am surrounded by Sabbath will be an act of resistance. It is countercultural, which means when you practice Sabbath, you will feel resistance. There will be an external resistance. The culture around you is a Sabbathless, rhythmless, hollow out your soul culture. To Sabbath is going to require intentionality. It's going to require preparation, which is one of the main reasons I think people are kind of intimidated by Sabbathing because we know it's going to take work in the week. Probably six days of it. It's going to take intentionality, preparation, and determination to go, go against the culture that we live in. To live differently, to be holy, and to be set apart. And this is not easy because what you are standing against is what the Apostle Paul refers to as the principalities and powers in Ephesians, dark spiritual powers and forces that are anti-Sabbath, and yet through Sabbath, we defy these powers, we resist, and we align ourselves with the God of the Sabbath, the God of rest. There will also be an internal resistance inside of you. Egypt isn't just around us, it is in us. To Sabbath, to rest, we have to resist the internal dynamics of restlessness in our fallen heart, in our flesh. Things like greed, envy, discontentment, anxiety, addiction. There is a tug of war inside of us. We feel a pull towards Jesus and his way, a genuine desire to be in relationship with God, to feel that, to know God intimately, to find rest for our souls, But we also feel a push away from Jesus and his way, a reluctance, a reluctance to give up our autonomy, our self-will, and surrender to him. The idea of Sabbath might sound relatively simple, right? Stop and rest. Easy enough, right? But actually practicing Sabbath is not easy. It's going to take preparation, intentionality, and it will take discipline. And this isn't about, like, making a set of rules and making sure that you follow those rules or else. More on that next week. But this is about doing our part to accept Jesus' invitation to his yoke and rest. Rest for our souls. Sabbath. Sabbath rest is our secret weapon against the struggle, against the powers that we face today. An entire day to remember who God is, what he has done, who you are, that you are enough, what you have is enough, that goes against everything that 4,000, 10,000 ads that you just saw that day. Everything that you see on social media that you're tempted to compare yourself towards. We need this day. So remember, when you face those internal and external forces that are anti-Sabbath, resist. Resist and remember, you are not a slave anymore. God is king, but he is nothing like Pharaoh. He is a Sabbath-keeping, Sabbath-commanding God. Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath, and he's offering you rest for your souls. The question is, Will you resist? Will you choose to accept his invitation to rest?
Again, if you engage with us on social media, we're, um, we're looking to find ways to make this practical for us. If you are interested in finding ways to integrate Sabbath into your life, um, we hope you join us. Again, it's, it's an invitation. It is. It's absolutely an invitation. Jesus invites you to it. Will you choose to resist? If I could, I'd like to pray for us now. Band, you guys can make your way on stage as well. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for showing us Sabbath. God, we knew we can read the scriptures and we can identify um, when you set apart that day, that you rested, that you created into existence, into the fabric of the universe, a rhythm of stopping, of ceasing, of resting, of delighting, of worship. And sometimes we just, we muddle that up. We forget your intentions behind it. And so, Jesus, we come to you and we thank you for, for showing us, revealing to us the intentions of the Father, why we need rest, and not only why, but how. And so, Jesus, as we enter into this time of learning about Sabbath, um, learning about this this day, this practice, and what it might look like in our lives, I know that there might be um, just connotations with it, positive or negative. And so, Jesus, again, this week, I just pray that you would reveal your heart to us, reveal your intentions behind Sabbath, the words that you share with us, come to me, weary, tired, burdened, stressed out, and I will give you rest. God, show us what that looks like in our lives because we are desperate for it. God, we are restless. And for some of us, it's more of a struggle than for others. But God, we are restless. Whether we're working, whether we're tired, whether we're a, a student, we are restless for more. And God, you know that at the end of the day, if we don't put our desires in you first and foremost, if we don't set up and make you our desire, you our foundation, that we will continually run and run and run for more and more and more until we're content with you. So God, Come alongside our restless and weary souls. Show us what it looks like to rest. God, it's a, maybe for some of us it might be a trust issue. God, I, I don't know if I can, I, 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 there's no way I can take a nap today. God, I have to work these hours. I have to. God, I just, again, I, I just pray that you would reveal to us your intentions behind this rest. Show us how to rest. Show us what it looks like. And God, help our unbelief. May we trust you more. Instill in us a trust in you, Father, that brings us into your presence, into your comfort, into your care, maybe out of our comfort zones but into the comfort and rest of your presence. God, we love you. We thank you for this time this morning together as a community. And we praise you, Jesus, above all else. It's in your name we pray. Amen.